One thing that separates Pro from beginner when it comes to 3D art is everything that happens after you hit render. Changing materials, better denoising, lens effects, advanced masking, and all of it without having to re-render your scenes. There's almost no limit to what compositing can do, and it's a key skill that you should learn as a 3D artist. This video is sponsored by CG Boost's Master Compositing in Blender course. What is compositing really? The answer depends on the industry you're in, but for 3D, it mainly comes down to layering multiple visual elements into a single seamless image or animation to ground all of it in realism and give it the desired artistic direction. Think of combining simulations with 3D elements, real footage, and color grading. You can do compositing in Nuke, Resolve, or After Effects, but obviously we're using Blender. And in Blender, you want to use the compositing workspace to do so. As with all workspaces in Blender, you can modify these to fit your needs. And this is how I usually have my workspace set up as I don't really like the backdrop system that comes by default. Instead, I have a separate window set to either the image editor and then open up the viewer node, or I have the 3D viewport open and enable the viewport compositor for the camera. It's good to know though that the viewport compositor doesn't work with all nodes. Plus it won't allow you to use Blender for pre-rendered image sequences either, but it's still awesome to see your compositing results directly in your 3D scene. Another major benefit to using the image editor over the 3D viewport is that it allows you to directly save the image with your compositing in it without having to re-render, which is exactly what I always did before knowing this little tidbit of information. To get the most bang for your buck when it comes to compositing, you'll want to use something called render passes. These are additional passes that Blender will perform when rendering your image or sequence that contain data to be used in compositing and can be found in the view layer tab. If you've watched some of my older videos before, you'll probably recognize a few, but essentially all of these play a role to control certain aspects of your scene through compositing. The three main categories being data passes, light passes, and cryptomat passes. Now that's all you need to know for now, as we'll cover them in relevant examples later. So let's kick that off with denoising. Balancing samples first to the time it will take to render is a huge back and forth that is largely solved by denoising nowadays. If you take a noisy low sample count render and plug the denoise node into your compositor, you'll get your denoised image, which is identical to enabling the denoise option in the render properties. But as you also know, this will often give a very blobby image, especially on detailed surfaces like this material here. To get a way better result, we can instead open the view layer render passes and enable the denoising data. This will give the render layer node a denoising normal and albedo output, which contain data on both the normals and color of your material to tell Blender what is actually noise inside a render and what is just material detail. By connecting these to the denoise node like so, you get a much better denoised image. Quick side note, you always need to re-render your image after enabling a new pass to get access to it in the compositor. Denoising is a relatively heavy process, however, so if you're running on slower hardware, it's a good thing to simply mute the node, so select it and press M to disable it until you've finished all your other compositing, and then you can re-enable it. Next, let's add some realism in the compositor. Depth of field makes any render better as it adds a lot of the natural properties of a camera lens to your renders. But did you know you can control your depth of field after rendering through the compositor? Instead of enabling depth of field in your camera settings, baking it into your render, disable the checkbox, but still target whatever point you want to be the focal point of your render here. Now in the view layer tab, enable the Z pass and render your image again. This will create a black and white depth mask similar to the mist pass, yet the Z pass is different as it's not only a depth map, but also holds your camera depth data, including the focal target of Z camera. By adding a defocus node and connecting the depth output to the Z input on the node and enabling use Z buffer to actually use the camera depth data, you can now change the f-stop and other settings to get the desired depth of field blur completely without having to re-render your shot. It's crazy, right? Also, by default, the preview option is enabled, sometimes resulting in some weird artifacts in certain areas to enhance the performance of Blender's compositor, you can simply disable it to get a better yet slower result. Now, besides having control over the amount of depth blur, you can also control the location of the focal point directly in the compositor. To do it, you first need a map range node to convert the data from the depth pass to a zero to one range, as it actually holds all the values in your scene. 
You can use the from min and from max to determine the start and end point of the range to convert. Next, add a color ramp, which will allow you to control the location of the focal point, with black being the part of the image that is in focus and white being out of focus. Just make sure to now disable the use Z buffer toggle as you no longer need the baked in camera data to decide the focal point. You can add as many stops to this color ramp as you'd like to get the desired result for your composite depth of field. And if at this point you're like, how the hell does he know all this? I'm right there with you. Learning things like these is not something you teach yourself. And although I've picked up various techniques through watching hours of Blender tutorials in my early days, most of the actual high level techniques I've learned from CG Boost's Master Compositing course by Daniel Nees. Daniel is a pro compositor at a Hollywood level VFX studio, having worked on major titles such as Guardians of the Galaxy and Indiana Jones and is also a teacher at CG Boost. His course not only covers compositing basics like the ones that I'm showing in this video, but many, many more and is especially amazing in providing perfect example projects that you can download to learn the ropes of both simple and advanced compositing. Believe me when I say that taking this course will open your eyes to a part of Blender and VFX that you've probably never considered. Learning compositing is a lifelong skill that is similar to first learning 3D and will change your creative output forever. If you decide to pick up the Master Compositing in Blender course, I can also highly recommend CG Boost's latest course, Master Cinematic Storytelling. Taught by Heroes of Bronze legend Martin Kleckner, these courses go together like cookies and milk. Covering topics like camera motion, lighting, color, and composition, you can pair this up perfectly with the compositing course to reach new heights as an artist. And if that wasn't enough to convince you, you can now get both these courses with an exclusive 25% discount with code Kaizen25 through the link in the description, but you have to be quick as this only applies to the first 99 people for each course. Now let's get back to some more of the amazing capabilities of compositing in Blender. Okay, so imagine this, you have an image sequence animation that you rendered for a client and that took you roughly six hours to render. But the client decides that this right cube in the animation needs to be a different material. Would you change it and re-render the entire thing, costing you another six hours? Well, probably, I know I would have before, but not anymore because you can actually control your materials directly through the compositor again without having to re-render a single frame. When I open this image sequence in the compositor, there is a ton of outputs and it looks kind of daunting, but it's really not as bad as it looks as these are simply all of the passes that were enabled and then created during the render process. It's basically a bunch of images combined into one through a multi-layer system. And that is because this file is not a PNG or JPEG, but an open EXR multi-layer file type, which was created specifically for compositing and HDR purposes by the VFX pioneers at ILM. EXRs are extremely powerful in VFX and 3D workflows and have a ton more benefits than just the multi-layer properties. And I highly recommend you check out this video by Polyfjord at some point to learn more about them. But for now, you'll want to set your output to be this file type. And then whenever you import your image sequence into the compositor, it should have all of these outputs available to you. As for the material, you need to use Blender's light passes. So before rendering, you should enable the necessary ones in the view layer tab. For most scenarios, using the diffuse and glossy passes is enough, but if you're also working with transmissive materials or volumes, make sure to include those too. To combine these passes into a normal looking image again, we need two mixed nodes per pass. One set to add, combining the direct and indirect light, and one set to multiply, multiplying the first mixed node with the color output. Do this for each light pass, and then finally add each pass together with another mix node set to add. This will give you your regular render again, but with the benefit of having full control over all of these layers. So now let's say you want to change the material of this cube on the right here to be a rough blue instead of a shiny red. By taking a U saturation node and plugging that into the diffuse color, you can then change the U of the cube to whatever you like. But as you change the value, all of the other colors in the image also change with it. And this is where cryptomats come into play. No, this isn't Blender's very own crypto scheme. It's the term for a mask containing color data for certain parameters. Blender allows for three types of cryptomat passes, object, material, and asset. In this case, I use the material pass as each object in this scene has its own material originally, but I could also use the object pass since they are separate objects. 
By adding a Cryptomat node, sending it to image and opening the EXR sequence, you can preview the pick option to see the mask options. Then hit the plus icon to select whichever material or object you want and add it to the mat. You can now preview the mat output to see that it functions as a black and white mask. If you've added too many and want to remove a material or object, the process is identical but instead use the minus button. So now I've selected the right cube as part of the mat and I can plug the mat output into the U saturation factor and voila, the cube is now blue without changing anything else in the image. To now also make it a very rough material, I'll add a color corrector to the combined glossy direct and indirect light and drastically lower the gain and up the gamma. That should remove most of the highlights and reflections and make the cube look very rough instead. Again, we need to use the crypto mat so we can limit the effect to the correct cube. Finally, I'm seeing some red reflection going on on the left cube, which can be colored with a mix node added to the indirect gloss pass set to color and using a bluish tint. Now for this shot, all of this works well enough, but in a professional setup, you can expect many, many more layers to all of this, allowing the most minute changes easily and procedurally without having to re-render ever again. Anyways, re-exporting this through Blender is also quite fast with this specific 50 frame render now rendered as JPEGs, taking a total of 2 minutes and 48 seconds to finish, whereas the original EXR export took around close to an hour to do, which is just a major benefit to a proper compositing workflow. With great power comes great responsibility. And in the case of compositing, enabling render passes will increase your render time by a considerable amount. For this project, a single frame without any render passes took around 35 seconds. And with the render passes that I required, it took roughly 68 seconds per frame. That's almost double. And you can imagine how much more time that would add on a several thousand frame long project. Another major thing to note is the file size. A PNG of this sequence comes out to around 2 megabytes, and the same shot in OpenEXR multilayer is around 34 megabytes. Especially when working with animations, this can easily be the difference between a 500 megabyte file and a 10 gigabyte file. Depending on which codec you use for the EXR, the file size does change, however. The default zip version even comes out to 250 megabytes per frame, but according to Pro Compositor Daniel from CG Boost's course, using DWAA lossy is just fine and saves you some valuable storage space. So it's really your responsibility as an artist to determine what is important to your project. Do you need every pass or just one or two? Do you need full quality or is lossy fine too? The choices are yours. Understanding compositing, even at just a basic level, will transform the way you work in Blender, but no amount of fixing it in post will save a cooked camera animation. So check out this video to learn how to make better camera animations for any project.